Hi, and welcome to Health Economics. My name is Dr. Dave Hebert, and I'm going to be the instructor uh, for this class. Uh, <clears throat> so what we're going to do, or what this class is designed to be, is just a big brief survey of health economics. Health economics prior to the pandemic was arguably one of the fastest growing fields in all of economics, uh, which itself is one of the fastest growing fields in both business schools and social science schools. <clears throat> now that the pandemic is on, and hopefully coming to an end soon, this field is just going to explode as more and more research is conducted, trying to explain and examine just what went wrong. What I wanna do with this lecture is give you a little bit of background on the field of healthcare in the US and how economists think about it. So let's just begin by examining a few quick statistics. So in 1965, <clears throat> we had 52% uh, if we did a breakdown of how all the costs of health care were paid for, we had 52% coming from what we could call out of pocket, right? In other words, for every dollar that was paid uh, in the US in 1965 on health care, over half of it came from us, from our own pockets. 25% came from private insurance, Uh, the federal government uh, paid a mere 8%, so I'll just call it Fed uh, government, 8%. And the remaining 12% or so, that came from state and local governments. Okay, so this is uh, for 1965. This is the breakdown. <clears throat> Okay. And if we look at this, the total health care cost of the U.S. Uh, in terms of GDP, which is just short for gross domestic product, in total, <clears throat> the U.S. spent uh, as a percent of GDP a mere 6% on health care. To put this another way, for every dollar that people earned in 1965, six cents went toward health care on average. Now we can fast forward to 2016, and we can look at these numbers again. Okay, so out-of-pocket expenses <clears throat> have fallen to only 12% of the total bill for healthcare. 35% of our healthcare costs are paid for by private insurance companies. 48% uh, is paid by the federal government and the remaining 10% or so, and again, I've rounded uh, to get these numbers to be a whole, the remaining 10% or so <clears throat> is paid for by state and local governments. Now, all told, in 2016, we spent approximately 18% of US GDP on healthcare, or to put this in the same way we did here, for every dollar that you and I earn, on average, we're paying 18 cents toward health care. Okay. <clears throat> now what should jump out to you immediately is the massive increase in the percentage of our incomes that we spend on health care. So in 1965, it was a mere 6%. In 2016, it's 18%. Today, it's even higher. And that's all pre-COVID. Why is this? Right? What we want to think about is what might cause greater expenses on, or greater expenditures on healthcare. <clears throat> One answer uh, that we could explore and that might be true is that Americans are just on average sicker than we used to be. So in what ways might we be sicker? Well, for one, obesity and obesity related complications remain the top killer in this country, again, pre-COVID, and obesity rates are on the rise. This means that other things constant, the average person in 2016 will likely require more medical care than the average person in 1965, just by virtue of increasing obesity rates. A second answer uh, might be that we are now more aware of diseases and more aware of treatments for those diseases than we were in 1965. So for example, mental health issues are at an all time high today, but most of this is because we're now aware of mental health as being a component of health 
than we were in 1965. We're also much better at treating mental health issues today, either through therapy or through pharmaceuticals. Okay, <clears throat> and so the point here is that even though this is a big increase, we can explain at least some of it as a change in the amount of things that count toward healthcare or in the change in the number of things that we're actually treating. As we treat more things, we're going to spend more money treating those things. The third answer, and the one that economists always like to kind of focus on, <clears throat> would be changing incentives. And specifically, there have been lots of changes to the incentives for delivering healthcare that might have actually had the effect of manifesting as higher prices for healthcare, which means that even if the first two factors that we talked about weren't happening, we would still get more spending on healthcare as the cost or the price of healthcare continues to skyrocket. Okay, now <clears throat> you might be wondering why we picked 1965 as our year for comparison. This is because in 1965, Medicare and Medicaid were passed into law and started to really take effect around 1966. So we can realistically divide this time period into the pre-Medicare Medicaid era and the post-Medicare Medicaid uh, era. So let's just go over what these policies uh, did and what they do. Okay. Medicare is divided into four parts today, part A, part B, part C, and part D. Parts, <coughs> excuse me, parts A and B are the original parts, parts C and D were added later. Part A uh, covers your hospital care for elderly people and is financed by a special tax on, on the paychecks of the working population. Okay, so this covers uh, hospital care, for uh, elderly or people of a certain age or higher, okay? And it's financed by a payroll tax, okay? <clears throat> so in a very real sense, those of us who are currently being paid for working a job are actually paying the medical bills of senior citizens today through the Medicare tax. In other words, our tax, our income is taken and redistributed toward senior citizens, right? <clears throat> now, this works out okay, at least in principle, because in the future, uh, as long as Medicare remains a program, uh, our medical bills will also be paid. by this program, okay? <clears throat> now, this should sound vaguely familiar for those of you who have ever heard of perhaps a pyramid scheme or a Ponzi scheme, or perhaps even what's now sometimes called multi-level marketing. Basically, the idea is that as long as more people are entering into the system than are leaving the system, the system will work. And if it sounds like that, it's because it's exactly how it's supposed to work. The trick here is that unlike a pyramid scheme, we don't have to convince anyone to join this because it's illegal not to. As long as the population continues to grow or at the very least stays constant, this works out pretty much fine. Unfortunately for us, the current US population birth rate is below the rate that we need to keep the population constant. So there might be a problem for us in the future, but only time will tell. <clears throat> Part B, uh, this covers uh, the uh, physician expenses or physician fees. So when you go to the doctor, <clears throat> what this does or what you have to do is you pay not only to be uh, at the hospital, which would be your hospital expenses and covered by Part A, but you're also going to have to pay for the physician's time, right? And part Medicare Part B uh, covers that, okay? Part C covers uh, managed care facilities. Part D covers um, 
excuse me, my computer started to go to sleep. Uh, part D covers prescription drugs, right? And in general, these three, part uh, C and part D, <clears throat> these are all uh, voluntary programs. You enter into them. And what happens uh, is that Medicare, parts B, C, and D, will pay uh, up to 75% of uh, the bill, and the patient pays uh, remaining 25%. Okay? Now, these are voluntary programs uh, that older people are eligible for but do not have to join. Uh, there is typically an annual fee uh, to join these programs, <clears throat> but overall, uh, we seem to we tend to see pretty large participation in these. 